me. So, um, so what types of data do you deal with? Um, mostly sort of day to day um, statistical releases. That's sort of the the kind of stuff for the paper each day, and then FOI and open data a bit more kind of for uh, bigger projects and things. And, and tell me a bit about how, for example, um, you have things set up so that you're notified when new data comes out. So w what kinds of things would you check first thing in the morning or check regularly, which are kind of regular supplies of data rather than you seeking out data? Um, it's the publication hub for the ONS. Um, I think it's sort of statistics.gov.uk, um, which is like a daily calendar of um, what's coming out at half nine each day. Um, so generally check that kind of a week before and, and make a note of what might be out next week that might look interesting and then check on the day whether it actually is interesting um, in order to kind of put out stories for the day. And is, is it literally just the ONS or, or are, the other, are there other sources of data that you subscribe to? So on a day-to-day -day basis, mainly the ONS. Um, I think we've got some alerts sort of set up for um, uh, they work for you for kind of um, parliamentary questions because um, occasionally you get some kind of quite good tables in that. Um, so I think there are alerts kind of set up for various um, towns and cities just in case anything vaguely interesting comes up through that. But so day to day, it's mainly just the ONS publication hub. Um, that kind of the main source for, for stuff that's sort of coming out today. And what sort of stories um, would you, would perhaps a reporter approach you or would you see something, um, a story that's been done that day where you think oh, that there's going to be a data angle to that or I should, uh, I should um, get some data to, to flesh that out? Um. We don't so much do that. I mean, I had an email this morning um, about the grammar school story that's out, that's out this morning, um, just to ask whether there was anything in the report. Um, so, and, and there was kind of a breakdown by areas, and some of the areas we cover, like Trafford and Kirklees and Calderdale. So um, I just went through the report from the Sutton Trust this morning just to kind of get the local breakdown and pull the tables out of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if we spot something kind of on the BBC or the or Mail Online or anything that that looks like it might have had data behind it, we'll kind of go and have a look and, and see if we can dig it out because that you get reports like um, Shelter put out reports on affordable housing and um, those kind of things like and Joseph Rowntree Foundation, all of those put out quite good reports and they're quite good about either sending us the data or putting it out in a format that's not too hard to deal with. So we can get kind of a local breakdown, which we can then pass on to people. <laughs> and and in those situations where there's, there's a story uh, emerging or breaking, or you're looking for a local angle, where would you typically go apart from, for example, the a charity that's that's behind the story, or um, uh, or the organisation that's that's behind a particular data set? Where would you go for additional data? Are, are there particular techniques you would use to to uh, get a bit of extra background? Um, I usually have kind of um, resource spreadsheets of kind of population data, those kind of things which are useful for kind of getting rates for local areas um, because a lot of things you get the raw number um, but you need to kind of get a rate for things else, else London's always going to come out as having much higher than everywhere else um, just because it's bigger. Um, so it's useful to have kind of the resource of on your computer just so you can kind of merge your data together when you've got those kind of things. Um, but yeah, otherwise it's, it's searching through the ONS for, for background on things. Um, and I'm going to invite um, members of the class to, to ask some questions in a moment, so I'm just giving them the heads up on that. So I'll mute my, I'll mute my microphone after this question. But um, what, uh, what pitfalls would you recommend to, to watch out for what sort of what things cause you problems or slow you down or um, uh, can possibly lead to mistakes or wasted time. 
Um, a lot of it's to do with how messy data is. Um, the current one that's really very annoying is um, English NHS Trust because they change the organisation seemingly every 10 minutes. So if you want to kind of compare data for previous years, you need to check that the NHS Trust you're currently looking at is still um, it still exists, it, that it hasn't picked up several other NHS Trusts that used to exist that have now been merged into it because that would mean that the data for previous years would be less because it was a small trust and the other date you might be looking for is somewhere else because I think that, like Trafford has been merged into central Manchester since about so early 2013 and it's those kind of things where data has changed and the kind of the organisation that the data refers to is different than it was in previous years. Um, you get the same problem with geographic boundaries because wards change from year to year and to a lesser extent or constituencies and, and local authorities sort of sometimes occasionally change kind of boundaries a bit so that's one of the things that is slightly annoying is trying to keep track of whether the data you've got has the change over time you're seeing is because there's actually been a change or because actually you're looking at data from one year to the next that refers to completely different places just with the same name because they've kind of merged in different different areas that weren't there before um, Otherwise, it's, it's the usual problems of um, PDFs, um, spreadsheets that are laid out strangely. You have to spend quite a lot of time sort of taking out empty rows and empty columns and sort of getting into a state where you can actually do anything with it. Because empty columns and empty rows, the, the thing you will do and then have to quit control Z on um, is do a sort, realise that it's got an empty column and you've only sorted one bit and left all your names exactly where you started. So nothing now is correct. And, what you think is the worst is actually not that, that one is um, one that you kind of quite is quite easy to do and quite easy to miss. So, so if, if you're comparing, um, for example, patches, locations over over a period of time, would you, I, I, would you recommend just ringing the authority concerned and saying this is what I think is the case um, over this period, and, and, and just checking that. Um, there haven't been any changes over the, that period, or, or if, there, if there are any changes that I should be aware of. Is that is that what you would kind of sort of advise? Yeah, it's kind of been aware of what might have changed because um, they do, and, and it's sort of it's sort of being aware of boundary changes, it's being aware of NHS trust merging, it's being aware of schools changing names. Um, obviously, with the whole academy program, a lot of them have changed names, so that's a disconnect in the data that you've got to then go back and solve. Um, so I think it, it's kind of not assuming that because it's the same name, it's exactly the same place. It's kind of making sure that you've actually checked <laughs> that it doesn't now refer to something different. Okay, well, I'm going to mute my microphone now and, and um, see who wants to ask a question. How do you manage your time to do all these? I mean, uh, how much time do you spend on studying the data themselves than to sort them out? Um, what is the ratio? Yeah, uh, we kind of have two priorities with the with the way the data unit is set up. Um, we've got sort of the day to day bulletins that we put out with kind of storylines for all the papers, um, and then we're kind of working on bigger projects um, as well. There's sort of the day to day bulletins that mostly it's ONS data and it comes out at half nine, and then um, they're trying to kind of get bulletins out as quickly as possible because obviously news desks want the data and want the information sort of as early in the day as possible so they can get a report to doing it. Um, so usually sort of mornings I'm doing that um, probably for the first kind of two, three hours of the day uh, depending on how much stuff's out and how much work it needs. Um, so this morning I've done two um, already because <laughs> um, generally they're looking for fairly straightforward stories in terms of you're looking for which areas are performing the worst, which are doing the best, which has seen the biggest change in a year or five years or whatever. So this morning we had household recycling and so it's 
which which areas are the biggest recyclers, which are the worst at recycling, and those kind of things. So it's it you know not doing particularly complicated data analysis with them. Occasionally you are maybe doing some percentages or working out a rate per population, but that that doesn't take that much time. Um, and to maybe then just writing it up and making sure it's kind of clear to newsrooms what what story there might be there for them. Um, so yeah, that's kind of I do that in the morning, um, and then sort of in the afternoon I've got time to kind of work on sort of longer term projects uh, and like getting FOIs back, um, learning to be quite organised with FOIs because they do take up enormous amounts of time and. Just not, just not asking for documents because there just isn't the time to go through them. Um, what I'm finding is the best way to kind of do FOI um, requests in a way that's kind of manageable. If you're doing lots and lots of council areas, is to kind of set up a almost a database request where you ask each council for sort of a certain amount of information. So the one I'm working on at the moment is asking them how many operations they've had to cancel because of bed shortages and staff shortages for each of the past three years. So all I do need to do when that comes back from each of them is to put that information straight into a spreadsheet. So that kind of saves time. Um, so I'm kind of building the spreadsheet as I go as, as responses come back. So it's kind of finding these shortcuts and ways of saving time and not giving yourself masses, massive, massive tasks to do that are just going to take up hours and hours of time, not really generate that much for all the effort. Um, again, um, with afternoons, I'm also working on kind of projects um, like the school scores that um, we put out recently. Um, so that's kind of an ongoing thing where um, I do some work on it and it would go after other people to look at and then we sort of slowly got to the point where we were kind of ready to publish and then it was kind of, it took over for a week of kind of getting it all ready for the papers and for online. So yeah, it, it's kind of, with projects, there's there's time in the afternoon, but obviously when, when we're kind of close to the deadline, it, that, they kind of take priority. Okay, thank you. Right. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> It's like big like brother, yeah. Um, sorry, can I ask you uh, which your background is? Um, have you studied data journalism in school or uh, well, at university, or uh, you got a traditional journalism background? Um, I've got a fairly traditional journal uh, journalism background. Um, I um, after university, I did the um, NCTJ short course, um, the 18-week one, and then I got a job on a lo local weekly paper um, down in Kent, where I was for sort of two and a half years, and then I moved to a regional daily um, in Wales, which is where I've been sort of more recently. Um, I kind of got into data journalism because I, I quite like working on statistics stories and, and that particularly when I came to Wales um, was where I was finding stories from um, because obviously um, the way we work to put in a news list every morning and you have to come up with something to put on, on it um, and particularly when you don't live in the area and don't know anybody when you arrive. Um, statistics stories are really quite a good way of having something to put on your news list because there's always something that's come, come out every morning like crime figures and um, things like that that you can kind of get a story out of. So I started doing that just so I could have something up on my list um, and sort of over time developed various sort of skills within that. Um, I did some training in it up in Manchester um, and some more last year and just kind of experimenting and, and finding new ways of doing everything because there's, there's loads of information on it out there. Everyone's very, who kind of works in the area with kind of publishes a lot of stuff online about what they're doing and how it works. Um, so yeah, just really been experimenting and, and kind of learning as I go. Yeah. And uh, how was the impact with data journalism? Because it's a pretty different field from the traditional one. I mean, uh, as a reporter, you don't have to search for statistics or numbers. So how was the first impact with this specific well, field of journalism? Yeah, um, I think in terms of impact, um, 
it's more the the kind of visualization and and what you can do with numbers kind of online that's that's the big difference i mean there's always been data journalism um journalists have always done things that involve kind of spreadsheets and analyzing data um it's not that unusual for news desk to kind of be given a story that goes oh crime's gone down 10 percent or these are the best schools in the, the region because this, they've done this well on their GCSEs. Those are kind of new stories, and I don't think that's kind of what makes data journalism new, in a sense. Um, I think what's really changed is, is kind of the ability to do visualizations, to do interactives, to really kind of take advantage of the data we've got. Um, because before, you'd write the story, um, you'd focus on maybe a very small percentage of it, just the best and the worst, and it would go in the newspapers or. 400 words and, and that would be it but now because we've got online and we can do so much more you can kind of put all the data up you can make a map you can do a chart um, it's much we can kind of get, get more out of it than we would have in the past um, and I think that's what's really made the impact and I think that's when you're talking about data journalism I think that's what people really think of is, is kind of the the interactives and the maps and, and the access to the large amount of data rather than the stories because I don't think those are so new to people. Um, I think I think they've always kind of existed to some extent. Um, but being able to do kind of a big interactive graphic or really does is quite impressive and people are quite impressed by it when you kind of see them lots of graphs. Uh, uh, which tools do you use to visualize data? Um, Mainly uh, for maps, Google Fusion Tables, because um, they are just the easiest and quickest way to, to do heat maps um, once you kind of build up a good supply of shape files. Um, I tend to use Tableau um, for charts and graphs and things. Um, I know a lot of people, the rest of the data unit, tend to use um, Data Wrapper and Infogram, um, sort of online. Oh. Um, so that they um, can kind of do those quickly and simply. Um, I just I like Tableau and um, kind of the you've got it's got much more flexibility in terms of you can add filters and yeah. um, you do much more in kind of impressive stuff with it. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of Tableau. But I think if you're just looking to kind of do a bar graph or a line chart or something like that. Um, stuff like that, data wrapper and, and infogram are quite useful for those. Just kind of get something done and get it up online, which in a lot of cases is, is really what you want to do. Just kind of illustrate your story. And um, sorry, just the last questions. And um, what do you think about the data journalism field? About you know the future, or are we going to have to learn some data journalism skills for you? All of you know, all traditional journalists has to learn some data journalism skills or uh, I mean in the future or or not? Um, what do you think about I mean next future? Um, <coughs> again I think it sort of comes back to the ways in which data journalism is new and the ways in which data journalism is, isn't new. Um, as, I, as I think I say, uh, there's always been statistics, numbers-based stories, and journalists have traditionally hated them and been terrible at them. Because um, <laughs> I, I did the NCE, um, and part of that is the portfolio, and there's a section in it called numbers, and any of the trainers will just be like, yeah, no, they're always terrible, and everybody hates doing it, and nobody can ever find stories to go in it. And it's just like, <laughs> seriously, we need to train journalists in basic numeracy so that you know, they can at least look, if they're confronted with a spreadsheet, they know roughly what they're doing and, and kind of how to get something out of it. So really, all journalists should sort of learn basic, what are now kind of seen as data journalism skills, but really should just be seen as basic reporting skills of if somebody sends you a spreadsheet of, of figures about your local area, you can work out roughly what you need and what it says. Um, because I think that is kind of something that journalists just tend not to be very good at because a lot of them kind of gave up maths at GCSE and very happily don't really want to go back there. Um, in terms of kind of visualising and, and the, the, that kind of side of data journalism, I think they're useful skills to have. Um, I don't necessarily think all journalists need to be able to kind of make 
complex interactives. Um, I think if you've got basic um, numeracy and Excel skills, making basic bar charts and, and line graphs really isn't going to be difficult to do because obviously once you've got basic Excel skills, you can do it anyway. Um, I don't think necessarily everybody needs to know how to make um, a fusion table map or anything more complicated than that. Um, just because it, it's not necessarily going to be relevant to everyone's job. Um, but in many ways, it, and how you can get the most out of it um, and what tools and skills you need to do that. Um, and depending on the type of story you do and, and the area you work in, it's, it's going to depend on what skills you need. But having this idea of it's not about just having a story in print or just having a story as a page on a website. It's about how you can get more out of it. So with data stories, it's about going, I can, I can add an interactive, I can add a visualization. Um, with community stories, it's I can add, I can have a community social media um, effort running alongside this story, or I can have comments, uh, talk about what's going on in the story. It's all those kind of things that you can add on to the story because you've got more scope through the internet, you've got more space, you've got more connectivity. Um, so it, whether the kind of stories you want to do are data to stories that those skills are useful or not, it, it's really about thinking about what's, what skills you can use to kind of make your story better. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's very important. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, it's Mariana. Um, I wanted to know uh, how much of your of the data come from uh, um, from just a, a, an internet research, just using the the right keywords, and how much does that come from uh, a proper request to an organization? Um, most of it is um, just stuff that's published, um, just because it's it. It's, there and, and the way we work is kind of looking at what's out today and what might be a story today. Um, I mean, FOI is very useful for getting data that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get because you want a better breakdown of something or you, you want particularly local or regional um, breakdowns because of, a lot of the time you'll get a national figure for something and you'll be like, well, I quite like a local breakdown of what that figure is. Um, but it's surprising how much stuff is published now. Yeah, um, that was, uh, was that I was uh, wondering about because uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, there's a lot of things that if you look at kind of lists of F FOIs people have done, um, I, I use sort of David Higginson's FOI Fridays a lot, um, kind of getting ideas from across the country of things that people have done. It's amazing how many of those things are actually published data sets if you can find them. Um, there was one the other week, um, a month. Also about um, missed appointments at hospitals, which would be done as FOI, but actually that that's a data set that is published by NHS Trust. Mm -hmm. um, I think monthly. There's there's a lot of NHS data, particularly it's published quite regularly, and quite broken down. So the thing is, it, it's kind of knowing which websites they're published on and how often they're published, and, and kind of that's why it's worth kind of googling stuff before you put in FOI. Yeah. That they haven't actually published it, they've just published it somewhere obscurely. Because uh, another one that we found um, is uh, breakdowns of reasons for A and E admissions for Welsh health boards. Um, so the classic ones of, of FOI for like how many people have been admitted to A and E for dog bites and bee stings, that, that's all on an obscure Welsh um, health observatory website. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of saves time and, and it, it, well, it saves your time and it also saves their my office this time because it's there and you can kind of do the analysis yourself. I think I, uh, we should also develop some skills um, on uh, how to uh, research on Google. It seems stupid but uh, sometimes it's also important to, to make a, a right search string in Google, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, there are the, lots of ways to kind of get the most out of, of um, Google searches and, and it's quite interesting um, 
just doing a search for Excel documents on council websites just to see what they've got kind of hanging around the websites because council websites are a nightmare to find anything on. Um, you're actually probably better searching them via Google because they just don't lay them out in any kind of useful manner.